Ellie. Welcome to Disabled and Proud. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be here. I'm, I know I just said it, but I'm actually genuinely really looking forward to today's conversation because I feel like I'm going to learn loads. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> so, and I really need to figure a better way of asking this because I've, I've been doing the exact same thing for however many episodes, but... The first question that I like to ask absolutely every single guest is, how do you refer to your disability? Yeah, so I would refer to myself as an autistic ADHD, -er, Mm -hmm. um, and I guess that's kind of what I go with. Um, I think there's quite a lot of debate with this one, especially within the autistic community of like person first language or identity first language. Um, And I think it's particularly hard to do with the combination of autism and ADHD because it's like yeah. I believe in like identity first language of like I am autistic it's a part of my being in the same way that being a woman is but mm-hmm. the language doesn't really allow us to do that with ADHD because it's like I am ADHD it doesn't really work so mm-hmm. I kind of go with ADHD for now until we've got a better alternative <laughs> yeah and that is I find autism and ADHD and neurodivergence just generally like a very interesting topic outside of this podcast that is what I work in and so I always find it super interesting when we're talking about how do we relate to these terms like you said person first language or disability first language and I think what people need to realize is there's no right or wrong answer it's whatever feels best for you and like what fits into your circumstance and how you feel and how you relate to it and so I love that actually for you it's like uh do you know what we don't actually have the best term yet. So this is what I'm going to go with. And I think that's a really bold statement to make because I think people expect us as disabled people to have all the answers immediately. And I, sometimes we just don't. Yeah. I think ADHD especially is like the the name of it just doesn't even kind of, it's not even accurate really at all. Like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder First of all, we don't really like disorder. Second of all, not everyone's got the hyperactivity side. You kind of just have an te- inattentive side. And it's not really attention deficit because sometimes I can focus too much rather than not enough. So I just feel like the whole name, we need a new one, <laughs> ASAP basically, but kind of working with it for now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So interestingly, I always like to go on to talk about childhood. And I think for you, this is going to be quite an interesting one, or like I could actually be completely wrong. I don't know, but obviously like I'm just making an assumption here. But because you were diagnosed later on in life, what was childhood like for you not knowing what your diagnosis was? Yeah, I think um, like young childhood, probably like there was signs that I was different I guess but probably not to like too much of an extent so um a couple of examples um when I was at nursery so I'm an August baby so I'm like the youngest in my year group yeah Um, and when I was like three turning four about to go from nursery up to primary school the nursery teachers had like got my mum in for a conversation and they'd said like academically Ellie's definitely ready to go up to school she's Mm -hmm. really bright child she kind of knows what's going on um but socially you might want to consider holding her back a year because she just isn't really interested in interacting with the other kids we've like tried to get her to mingle but she kind of is just in her own little bubble her own world does her own thing um so like you might want to think about that um but then kind of nothing else was really it was kind of like oh no she's just the youngest girl in the year she'll be fine she's just a bit shy it'll come with time um and then that was kind of that and then I guess through primary school um I had my cousin, who is a boy, he was in the same year group as me. Uh-huh. Um, so I think I just basically copied him from that point on. So throughout primary school, I was a big, big tomboy because I think it was just like I had someone to model myself yeah. off. Yeah. Um, so I think it was more just like copying that. And that kind of, I guess, covered up some of my social differences because it was mm-hmm. I think it's easier to be friends with like stereotypically be friends with boys rather than it was to be friends with little girls because I think there's more rules in female friendship generally that's yeah. very like generalizing here but for me it was kind of like break time play football like play games it like, wasn't as like complicated I think to navigate uh-huh. um so I think yeah there was like definitely signs of difference in my younger childhood um but I would say it was more throughout like secondary school and teenage years that mm-hmm. I had a really really tough time with it um so yeah I think it was like I was 13 I think when I first started with like really 
low mood I think at the start it was kind of just classed as like oh you know hormonal teenage girl yeah. like everyone has a hard time I think it's the same with the social differences as well because it's like oh no like girls are just like that like it's not very nice time for anyone being a teenage girl like yeah everyone's hormonal all of this stuff so I think that was kind of how it was explained away at the start of kind of like moody teenager yeah um but then when I was around 15 that was when I was first referred to CAMS the children and adolescents mental health service so um that was when things got quite bad in terms of like being really overwhelmed being really tearful um kind of having what I was told were panic attacks which looking back were probably like meltdowns or shutdowns Uh um but at that time was just kind of diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder panic disorder um agoraphobia over time um all sorts of different things but all within the mental health space and um, so it was always kind of explained in that way and I was given antidepressants and we tried loads of different types of therapy and nothing just really seemed to work um and then eventually when I was 17 I ended up dropping out of school dropping out of sixth form and declining my uni offers um so that's kind of when things reached their peak so I would say it was like definitely more through secondary school that it was obvious that I was struggling um but no one kind of could put their finger on exactly what it was, I guess, because they weren't really looking for autism or ADHD in someone that looked or acted like me. Um, And I guess by that time as well, I was probably masking so heavily that it would have been really difficult for them to, like me and my mum talk about this quite often, of like, at that time, I was appearing as though I was just struggling with anxiety because I was so heavily masked in terms of like, to me in secondary school, I think it was like, the most important thing on my list was just like fit in, just like make everyone like me fit in, you know, get in with the popular girls, just like, just do anything I can for people to like me. So I was masking so heavily that it's like, I think I feel a lot of like sadness that it was never identified, especially because I was so lucky to be under Cam's care and have that Mm -hmm. amount of like access to medical professionals, because that's such a privilege. So many people can't even kind of get the chance to see or a psychiatrist or whatever it might be and I was seeing them a couple of times a week and having a key worker and having a psychiatrist and all of this stuff so I think that makes me sad that they they didn't pick it up when I was like probably in the top five percent of people who can access that care sort of thing um but then I look back and I'm like actually by that point I was already masking so heavily it's almost like they needed to catch it before that point to be able to like see it in me Mm, yeah If it's okay with you, I'd love for you to explain what masking is for those who don't know, because I find this such a, like, it's such a prevalent part of autism and ADHD. And it's better coming from someone who has autism and ADHD, because the explanation that I'm going to give is very different from the explanation that you're going to give. So if you were, if you were able to describe it for someone who doesn't actually know what that is, what, what would you say? Yeah, I'd say it's kind of the covering up of your autistic or otherwise neurodivergent traits in an attempt to appear holistic or neurotypical. Um, So I think obviously for me as an undiagnosed person, that was all very, I I wasn't aware that I was masking because I didn't know that I had something to mask. Um, And I think there's some parts of it that are like more subconscious or unconscious and some parts of it that are conscious so I think it ranges a whole load of things like I knew that I was changing the way that I communicated in conversations because I knew that people didn't like me if I was a certain way so that I was kind of aware that I was changing the topics I was talking about or changing my tone of voice to appear more friendly or um stuff like that like I guess making a choice to behave in a certain way to kind of to fit in but I think there's other things where it is so kind of unconscious of like making eye contact because you're told as a child when someone's talking to you you look in the eye or else it's rude so Mm -hmm. I would just do that not realizing that everyone found it as uncomfortable as I did um because I'd just been told it was the right thing to do and and stuff like that I think similarly like um for example travel I before lockdown I was traveling living in Cambodia on planes all the time going through airports and I didn't realize that that was overstimulating for me so I would just force myself through the journey and then maybe a couple of days later I'd have a big cry or have a panic attack and I'd just think oh I must I must just be like homesick or I must be tired or I must be whatever it is that's making me feel this way whereas now I'm aware of the fact that 
I have sensory sensitivities. So I know that traveling is a stressful environment for me. So I'm more aware of it at the time. So it's more difficult for me now than it was. But then I guess that prevents the, the big cry two days later. So I think, yeah, yeah there's a whole range of things, but basically either overcompensating for the ways that your, your traits show up or covering up those traits by behaving in a certain way. To, to fit in basically to be safe to survive to try and make people like you um to just go under the radar I guess yeah it's honestly it's such a minefield because I think I can completely understand what you said when you said some a part of me grieves for not knowing sooner because had you known sooner or you, like you're never going to know but had you known sooner like you said you would have been able to prevent like shutdowns and meltdowns and and how would that have changed like those those parts of your life that could presumably would have been quite difficult but actually then as you also said you probably wouldn't be where you are now had that happened so actually like both sides of the coin there's positives and there's negatives <laughs> so so I think like the biggest thing that I grieved for or the thing that I'd like held a lot of like bitterness for in the past um was dropping out of school because I think it was like if I'd have had the right support at that time I would have been able to get my A-levels I would have been able to go off to uni um I think that was the thing that I had a lot of like bitterness for at the time so I think I've been really lucky that my career has kind of gone the way it's gone since I got diagnosed because I've almost not had time to be to be sad about that because it's like it's kind of cheesy but true like it's proof that everything happens for a reason because now I'm doing things that I probably wouldn't have even had access to do had I have got those A-levels and degree yeah. it's like it's worked out better in the end but I think that that was the main thing in the past that I did hold a lot of like upset for I think as well just um I think there's that feeling of like just feeling really sad for younger mm-hmm. Ellie like I I especially like the social side of things I had a really really rough ride right until getting diagnosed so I've never yeah. really fit in social groups and people have like really actively disliked me and I've never really been able to understand why um and all of these things and I think I genuinely got to a point of being like I must be a horrible person or I must be a bad talking about diagnosis what what made you think or like even pursue the idea of a diagnosis with autism and ADHD what was the like catalyst for that as such yeah so I think so I'd always been diagnosed in the past with kind of anxiety anxiety related depression agoraphobia panic disorder Um, and I think the more that time went on I just kind of realized that they just didn't really fit right so the way that my kind of mental health like manifested I guess was that I I would have like six months of being like fine air quotes fine of being like quite ambitious quite bubbly Mm -hmm. quite energetic wanting to do loads of things like quite I don't know how to word it like just fine basically yeah and then every once or so I would just have a big crash and burn so it would be like I'd become really overwhelmed I'd become really tearful I'd have these panic attacks I wouldn't want to leave the house um that was kind of like a six month cycle and it happened kind of like over and over again of like it happened the first time when I had to drop out of school and then I kind of got myself better and then I got a job and then after six months I had to leave the job because I was too overwhelmed from the job and then it happened with another job and then I'd been traveling and I had to come home from all of these things it was just like whatever I did every six months or between six months and a year I would have this big crash Mm -hmm. um and I think the more that I I became really um like just fed up with that basically because it was just like you know I'm doing everything they've told me to do I'm taking the antidepressants that they've told yeah. me to take I've done all of these therapies that they've asked me to do I'm reading every single self-help book on the planet of to like how I can look after myself and yeah. nothing is getting me to like where I want to be it just catches up with me all the time I think I was f- feeling really fed up with that and I think like realizing that yeah it didn't the labels that I'd been given just didn't really fit like I wasn't an anxious person I just became really overwhelmed when I had these like lower points and I think it was like you know I don't I'm not necessarily worrying I'm just I just get to a point where everything is too much so I think it was like just going around in my head of like that there's something else going on here but I just don't know exactly what it is yeah um and then I went through a bit of a stage of being convinced that it was BPD um borderline personality disorder because I think that was the only thing that I'd ever seen like 
as an explanation or represented on social media as a reason why a woman or a person marginalized their gender might go from being very high to very low. It was kind of like the mental health side, the, the bipolar, the BPD. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's what I do. I go from having a really good phase to having a not so good phase. Like mm-hmm. maybe that's what's going on for me. Um, and I originally started like trying to talk to the doctors about that. And they were just like, no, that's not you. That, that doesn't fit. Like it's just anxiety. And I was like, it's not just anxiety. Yeah. Um, but they were kind of confident that, that it wasn't that um, and then it was just out of luck really so I was having counselling I was kind of like getting to the point where I was coming back into one of the low phases mm-hmm. um, and I was having counselling through my job at the time and I brought up a conversation that I'd been having with my partner at the time like a little bicker we've had um, and the counsellor just said to me has it ever been looked into why you take things so literally um, and my answer was like, um, no, it hasn't. Um, but I think I know what you're hinting at here. And then kind of went away and did loads of Googling and searching on Instagram and TikTok and just whatever I could get my hands on, basically. Uh-huh. And I was just like, yeah, this is it. we found the answer here. So I think it was like a combination of the two of like, I was very much in that brain space of being like something else is going on. I know that something else is going on. I need to find what it is, but I, I don't know what it is. Um, and then just pure luck. Mm -hmm. chance of having that comment so it turned out afterwards um that her son was autistic and adhd so i guess she'd maybe been able to to pick up on things pick it up yeah yeah in the way that other people hadn't been able to notice it as much um so that was just i guess i i think that's why i'm so grateful and why i feel such a need to like do this work to help other people get diagnosed because or to have an understanding of themselves because like i am just that's just pure luck that's just pure chance it was you know the fact that I had that specific counsellor the fact that I was able to access counselling through my job at the time the fact that I brought up that specific conversation in counselling because it I think it wasn't really something that I would have usually talked about either like I think normally in counselling you go into like stuff in the past or like deeper things whereas it was just Mm. like oh I'm feeling a bit rubbish because me and my boyfriend have had an argument this is what the argument was about yeah and then it kind of turned out from there so yeah it was very grateful that that conversation happened but I guess from there I kind of went on and initially spoke to someone at the NHS and they kind of agreed that yeah I should probably go for an assessment um, and maybe should look at ADHD as well and then once I got into that kind of rabbit hole I decided to go for my ADHD um, assessment first because it's not great with waiting lists and stuff like that. Yeah. And it felt like I could get a more tangible outcome. So if I got my ADHD diagnosis, I could get medication for that, which would hopefully get me out of that low point that I was in. So it was like, this yeah. one's more urgent, I guess. So I went for that one first. I went privately for that one in October, 2021. Um, and then got my autism in April of last year. So it was like a six month period between the two of them, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, a lot of a lot of luck basically <laughs> is the reason that I got my answer that I did. Um, and I think that's, yeah, what's, what made me want to speak up because it was just like how many other people are out there in the exact same position that I was in of just yeah. like knowing that something's not quite right, but not ever being given the, the language or the explanation as to what that is. And I think that that's a really important point is that you won't be the only person. And there is, and particularly like, obviously very generalization, but particularly women go under the radar when it comes to autism and ADHD, because we have such a a fixed view of what that looks like in terms of it's the little naughty white boy at the back of the classroom chucking pencils at you. Like that's, that's still what the image is when actually, like you said, it's not that. And actually the, the term ADHD doesn't really fit what it is. And, and it's so interesting. And I think particularly for women, because so many women go under the radar and so many women are now getting like late or like what we would call an air quotes, late diagnosis, because it's just been overlooked. As you said, like generalized anxiety disorder, depression, teenage hormones, like, oh, you're just a woman, get over it, pull your socks up. Like, it's not that bad. When actually there's something else at play, but because we haven't delved into research for particularly for women in medical area but that's a different topic for a different point in time because we haven't had that exposure and experience so many people are going under the radar and I think it's probably partly why I do what I do is that I love to make sure that people feel very proud of who they are and their disability because there's going to be someone out there who doesn't 
And if they can see two people having these conversations and be like, yeah, do you know what? Sometimes it is just a bit shit, but actually it's great on the whole. Is that not worth it? And like, I completely yeah. understand that. Yeah, I think, I think it's such, um, like, especially like you say, there is kind of a wave of people, like the more that more people are talking about it, there is a wave of people having these discoveries, which is then really sadly met with, just like grief from the media of like oh everyone's getting diagnosed now there wasn't all this back in my day like you know it's a trend everyone's diagnosing themselves from TikTok and it's like no that's not the case these people are getting answers for things that they've struggled with their whole entire lives yeah that should be a really joyous moment of like oh I finally understand who I am now I can finally learn to work with myself I can finally forgive myself that that should be a a wonderful moment obviously it comes with the grief as well of like what could have been but overall getting that answer should be should be a wonderful moment in someone's life not something that's getting spoiled by grumpy man down the road going oh (laughs) you're just jumping on the back of a bandwagon I think it's and I think it'll put people off going to speak to their GP Mm. or whatever because they might think oh I don't want them to think that I'm just jumping on the bandwagon or you know they might not take me seriously and I think it's a really a really dangerous thing that's like kind of happening in the media at the moment and I think again tying into that thing about the fact that it's women I think if you were to to re- it is a big generalization but um if you were to kind of reframe and it's like suddenly loads of men were getting diagnosed with this disability later on in life I imagine it would be like oh you know there's this wave this is epidemic of people we need to look into why this has happened yeah. we need to take this more seriously but because it's because it's mostly women and people marginalized for their gender um, and people of color and trans people and all of these kind of marginalized groups of people that are the ones getting diagnosed it's just like oh it's a bit of a bandwagon everyone's jumping on it yeah everyone just wants to be part of the same clubs so they're all getting involved and when actually it's really not the case at all like at all and there's a reason people are marginalized and, it's, <laughs> and here we are <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So I really love the fact that you stepped in to do what you do now. And obviously you've just announced you've written a book and perfect timing to talk about how your disability has impacted your career and what you do now. So wax lyrical about your book because I'm really interested in learning about this. Yeah, I am so excited about it and it it was like both a really big thing to do, but also, I don't know, didn't feel that way in a way because it was just like all of this stuff that I've been talking about for the last couple of years and going through for the last couple of years and absorbing every scrap of information I could about the last couple of years. It was all up there in my brain. Um, So it was kind of therapeutic in a way to get it all out onto paper and to organize it and structure it. And I think it was really good for me to, there's like some memoir-y bits in there as well. So I think it was like tricky to kind of, go into those places that I maybe hadn't gone into yeah. before but it was really good for me as a whole to kind of put that into something that I was really proud of um I think yeah. um so yeah I'm really excited it's it's called Unmasked it's the ultimate guide to ADHD autism and neurodivergence um and I would say it's the best way to describe it is just like an overall top view of all things kind of yeah ADHD autism neurodivergence and late diagnosis so it's kind of not going too deep into any of the topics yeah. but it's just like a bit of, a bit of a first place to go I think that was my main thing when you get diagnosed now whether that's going to a medical professional and getting a medical diagnosis or whether that's self-diagnosing because you've realized yourself after doing loads of research online it's just kind of like yeah congrats you're autistic see yeah. you later yeah um and all of the understanding that I have has come from just spending hours and hours online and learning from other creators and research that I've had to do off my own back. Um, And I think it was kind of like, okay, we we can make that handbook for people as a first point of call of like, this this is gonna help me understand myself better. This, I can give this to my friends and family so they can learn to understand me a bit better. They can see what's going on for me. Um, So I think that's what I tried to do with it. Um, But I'm really excited. Um, I think it's like a really vulnerable thing at the moment of like the first people who are doing endorsements and stuff are starting to read it. And it's like, oh, actually, people are reading this. Like, I think at, at times it sort of felt like a diary entry or a journal or just like, yeah, yeah me. With it. And it was very like a private thing. And now I'm like, oh, no, people are actually going to read all of this stuff. So that's really <laughs> nice. Um, but it's really exciting. I'm really exciting, excited for um, people to get their hands on it. 
Yeah. And I think it's really wonderful what you just said about like diagnosis or self-diagnosis, because I think it's the same with all disabilities, right? Like you don't get a handbook that's like, welcome to the disabled club. Here you are. It's very much your left. Like, yeah, here's a stamp on a piece of paper that says like, yeah, you are now disabled. Boom. Off you go. And you're not given anything. And that's whether you have a limb difference. That's whether you have a spinal cord injury. That's whether you become like you are suddenly diagnosed with neurodivergence. Like it's all the same. You don't get this handbook that's like, okay, so here's a whole backlog of history that could help you. Here are some people that will be able to help you in the right direction. It does not exist. So the fact that you have created that, particularly for neurodivergent people, is amazing because we get so much information from online, right? But sometimes a lot of it is just shit. (laughs) Sometimes it is just bad. So it's amazing that you've collated all this like personal information, but also things that are going to help other people and been like, here's a book, you can read it and it will, it will explain as to why you feel the way you feel, but also it'll help you navigate bits and bobs as well, because how many times have you felt like you haven't been able to navigate yourself because you didn't necessarily know what was going on? And had you had that, it would have been completely different. Yeah. I think like it just, like you say, it's just people, I think people overestimate how much support you get as well. Like people are like, oh, great. You've got your diagnosis. Like you must be, you know, going through it. It's like, nope, I got my diagnosis. Now I got waved out of the room. Like it's all, it's all. And I think that's the thing as well, where like, it's become my job now as well to talk about these things and like speaking to companies and writing and creating content and people then, but then there's still this kind of thing of like, oh, well, you don't have a degree or you've not studied this thing, like you're not an expert. And I'm like, no, I am because I've lived it for my whole life. And also I've spent the last two years absolutely obsessing over every single piece of information I could find. Yeah. Um, so I think, I don't know, it feels almost in a way like writing a book gives me some of that credibility that I've always I completely had understand that. As much. I completely, um, completely understand that. Like I can understand that in my core because I think people are like, oh, you've not studied disability. And I'm like, no, it's just been my life. Like yeah. I'm an expert by proxy. That's how it works. Like these things you don't get to study. Like you just learn on the job. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah like, so yeah, yeah I'm really excited that it's um going to be out there in the world and it was really nice as well actually to so I've tried to include quotes and thoughts from loads of different people um and a lot of the people that I've kind of become friends with on my journey and taking quotes from in the book are creators that I actually learned from like back when I was looking into it before getting my yeah. diagnosis so there's like people where I followed their accounts and they've like kind of opened that door for me of being like oh yeah I experienced that in the same way that they do or I can relate to what they're saying they've actually been part of me getting my answers myself and then I've kind of yeah. gone on to like spread that to more people but to get to include some quotes from them in there was was really like a nice full circle moment I think yeah that's a really nice way to give back as well you know like you've helped me on my journey so like here you go that and I think that's really sweet as well Oh, I love that. (laughs) Super heartwarming. This got really wholesome really quick. (laughs) So for you, thinking about younger version of you, do you have a piece of advice for younger version of Ellie? I would say like maybe a couple of pieces. One of being like focus on the people that love you rather than the ones that don't. Because I think I did spend such a long time just being desperate for people to like me. And I morphed and molded myself into so many different people just to fit in with friendship groups and, you know, behaved in certain ways and dressed in certain ways and did certain things and just didn't really have a sense of Ellie as a person for like basically my teenage years and my early 20s until I got diagnosed I was very much whoever I thought the people around me wanted me to be at that time um whereas if I'd have actually just focused on being myself maybe I wouldn't have been as like air quotes popular but I wasn't really very popular I wasn't any better off for doing it really because although I might have like sailed through friendship groups I never really belonged in them um whereas if I'd have just kind of accepted my kind of quirky and weird and slightly nerdy self right from the get-go maybe I would have found a quirky and weird and slightly nerdy friendship group where I actually would have belonged but because I was so intent on 
on being liked generally I kind of never had the chance to do that that's something that my mum like said to me so many times through school she was like why do you always want to be friends with the popular girls like they're not like you they're yeah. loud they're bitchy and I was like I don't know I just feel like you kind of I think any kind of woman or person marginalized to their gender that's been through high school it's just that it's like rock and hard place, isn't it? It's either you, you're liked by them and it's yeah. not a very nice place to be or you're not liked by them and it's not a very nice place to be. So I think that'd be my thing of like, just focus on the people that like you for who you are. Um, and also like, don't worry about the shoulds so much. Like, mm-hmm. I think, like I said, the fact that I dropped out of school and declined my uni offers really, really like held bitterness within me for such a long time. Cause it was like, mm-hmm. oh, I, like I, I, academically I, I did quite well at school like my GCSEs and my AS levels and my predicted grades were were pretty good and it was like oh I should I should have got my A's and I should have gone off to uni and got a degree because I'm you know this like gifted and talented yeah. child and I should have had this potential and I should be having a good career by now and I should have done all these things um, and I think that really took up a lot of of brain space for a long time yeah. rather than just being like actually I don't have to do anything I can do whatever feels right for me and it's fine that you know up until like until this kind of all started my jobs have been I worked at a post office um, I worked at a bank yeah. I worked in a call center I worked did some marketing work like I've done all of these things that you know they've all added to my life experience and there's there's parts of them where I look back and I'm like mm-hmm. actually that was awful that like, I hated that but there's parts that I'm like oh no that was really nice like working in a post office was the first thing that I did after dropping out of school and that was so good for me just to be amongst yeah people that like they were just cute little oldies coming in for their pension they liked me for who I was and I could just talk to people and it improved my social skills and it brought my confidence back and it gave me some structure and routine and it's like I wouldn't have had any of that had I gone off and done the thing that I air quotes should have done um so I think it's yeah those two things of like focus on the people that love you for who you are and then also don't worry about the the like path that everyone says that you should do just kind of focus on what feels right yeah what I love about what you said is I honestly you couldn't pay me enough money to go back and be a teenager you genuinely like you could offer me like all the money in the world and I'd still be like no thanks like I'm just I'm just not gonna do it like it's just not worth it (laughs) if I come across like a group of teenage girls, my heart still starts going. Like if I'm on a train and a group of teenage girls get on my heart, it's still like, well, I'm like, Ellie, you're literally like 10 years older than them. But I think <laughs> it is still a thing of like, yeah, it's just, I think everyone kind of looks back and like, oh, your school years are the best years of their life. And like, no, they're literally not. Like they're not at all. Yeah, school years are, are like, particularly I think for disabled people, school years are, could be really divisive. And I've had this conversation with quite a few people actually who were, born disabled and went through school and what I've come in my like year and a bit of doing this podcast and talking about disability and I'm an expert by proxy is that when you're a young child with a disability everybody wants you to succeed it does not matter they want to see you do well and they're like yes like go on you're the disabled kid and you can do it and then there's a massive shift when you go to high school and it's like oh you're a bit of a health and safety hazard now oh don't know if you should do that or oh, you, you're not necessarily going to fit in with the like quote unquote popular kids because you're not like them and and it just it's such it's such a messy few years that actually do you know what I'm really glad I'm over and done it with it like I don't need to do it again I don't need to experience that again like it's too much like hard work it's not fun <laughs> definitely and I think that's like um something that I think about as well of like you know it was a really tough time for me as someone that was undiagnosed um, and someone that was masking but they were it's still sort of a certain level of privilege that came with that like it's not yeah. fun to constantly change yourself to go under the radar but at least I was kind of able to like yes I didn't really belong yeah. anywhere but I wasn't like visibly that different or it wasn't as hugely obvious so there was yeah. sort of a certain level of protection within that and I think it's like yeah nobody wins because I think my mum often I, keep saying what my mum says but it turns out mums do actually know everything when I first got diagnosed when I had that kind of sadness of like oh I just like why didn't they 
discover this like back when I was younger and my mum was like but if they'd have if you'd have gone to CAMS at 15 and they'd have diagnosed you you wouldn't have wanted to know you wouldn't have accepted it you would have denied it at all costs because all you cared about by that point was fitting in and if somebody if you'd have had to go back to school and be like oh hi I'm autistic there's no there's no way in hell that I would have done that yeah um, which again she is right like I just like at least when I although it was kind of I've missed out on a lot of things by um not going like by going undiagnosed for that extra 10 years I guess there is actually I was when I got the diagnosis I was ready I was like wanting it I wanted these answers and I was ready to take it in as part of who I was rather than maybe as a teenager it would have been like that's not me I'm not having anything to do with that so Mm -hmm. yeah I think like you say there's, there's kind of pros and cons of all of it infuriatingly mums are nine times out of ten right (laughs) and like when I was younger I used to be like yeah mum whatever but as I'm getting older I'm like Elaine like you know what you're (laughs) talking about like where has this wisdom come from (laughs) and it's all like it's all the time I'm like she'll say something and I'm like no 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 that's not right and then like two weeks later I'm like I'm really sorry what you said was right (laughs) I should have listened (laughs) my mum's remedy for everything has like when I was like struggling when I was having these panic attacks when I was overwhelmed it's always been just get a good night's sleep and I used to hate it because I like that felt so minimizing of like I'm not just tired mum the world is ending I am so chronically depressed and I hate everything and everyone like I'm not just tired but like it's right like even now if I'm having a bad time I'm like yeah I just need a good like obviously the dis- like the thing isn't going to not be there in the morning but it's going to feel so much more manageable in the morning if I'm well rested um so that's the one thing where like anything you could be like any sort of illness it's like just get a good night's sleep and I used to hate it so much I'd be like you're not listening to me you think I'm just tired but then I'd be like oh no I actually do feel better this morning <laughs> that's really funny because my mum also says the exact same thing she's like okay are you tired and I'm like <laughs> annoyingly yes I am tired I will go for a nap and I'll come back to the situation later and I will feel better so I completely understand that what I love is that uh, well what I love personally I think that when you go through some form of hardship or something difficult you learn a lot more about yourself during hardship than you do when times are good that's factual and I was wondering have you noticed a particular trait like a positive trait about yourself that when you've been through hardship on reflection you're incredibly proud of I would say like my ability to stay soft like I think I I have had such a hard time like socially in like romantic relationships that was a big one that came up in my um autism diagnostic assessment um was like can you tell me about a time that you've misunderstood other people's emotions and I was like ah yes actually (laughs) every single like talking stage that I've had like I've always I've I had a massive run of like where I would think that I was like on the way to being in a relationship with somebody and then we just it wouldn't so it'd be like oh yeah we're seeing each other and then suddenly no I'm not interested in you and I think looking back that was me not being able to read between the lines of like does this person just enjoy my company do they are they just attracted to me is this something just casual but my brain would go oh they're being nice to me they're showing me attention we're in love (laughs) because it didn't like it wasn't able to kind of like like understand exactly the unspoken rules of all of those things um but I think my ability to now through all of that through through friendships through being removed from friendship group through being bullied through all of that stuff is to like still be that that soft loving person and to still let me I think my guard is higher now because I think it takes me a bit more to let people in but I think generally I am still I kind of open to to friends and to meeting people and to I will always kind of put my heart on my sleeve and do do as much like I when I care about someone I care about them so deeply and I think that would be a thing that would have been so easy for me to lose because it's like got me stung so many times before and I've you know been kind of ostracized so many times before it would have been really easy for me to just close myself off and be like right well I'm not letting anyone else in now because I don't want to get hurt again I'm not putting myself out there to make friends because no one ever likes me it would have been really easy for me to just kind of go into self-defense mode and almost like build a castle around myself but I think like that hasn't happened I've still kind of I still really care about people I still do a lot of my friends I'll still like go up my way to show them that I care about them and I think that's something that I'm really kind of grateful as well that has stuck with me because I think it would you know I think when you spend a lifetime being told that you're too much 
it's quite tricky to to still do those things um yeah. but I think it's always gonna be worth it in the end of like it's you know the friendships that I've made now since getting my diagnosis of other like late diagnosed people are like some of the most rewarding and lovely friendships that I've ever had and if I'd have closed myself off I, I never would have like got the chance to to make those I think so I think that's that's a big one like my ability to to stay soft in a hard world <laughs> oh I, I actually I think that's a really important one because I think what you said you could have built up literally a fortress around you and been like no nobody's coming in I don't understand I don't want to do no 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 but actually you haven't, you've let yourself still be incredibly vulnerable, let yourself still be like you say, incredibly soft. And actually in a world where it can be really difficult, it can be really hard. That's a really beautiful thing to be able to do, to be like, yep, I've gone through hardship. Yep. I've had really shit times, but actually I still love people. I still want to go out and experience all these things. Even if I might get stung, I still want to stay soft. And I think I think everybody can take that as a piece of advice is just to stay like, keep, keep being soft because we're told you know like don't show emotions or don't do this don't do that but do because actually that's what brings people together like when you walk into a room and you try to make friends have you made friends from being a stern-faced bitch no I don't know anybody who has like show me the person who has and I will show you a liar (laughs) so keep that softness remain soft and I love that as as like a positive trait for yourself but also for a piece of advice like oh makes my heart all warm (laughs) I think it's a really tricky thing to do as well like I think it is like it's almost like a a natural thing to do like I think you know it's it's most of our all of our natural responses to be open and and loving and and all of this stuff but it's also so easy to build a wall up so I think it's like just kind of trust that natural instinct to to be kind and be soft I think oh I love that so this is I think this is my favorite question because everybody comes out with different answers as disabled people as a general and I'm pretty sure I can keep it as general because it it goes across all the boards nine times out of ten we can experience what I like to call weird questions so I'm going to preface this with my weird question that I always get is either did a shark bite your arm off or what was the accident like now interestingly I I wasn't bit by a shark that would have made headline news and I would have been all over the newspapers <laughs> and I can confirm that I have not been equally I've not been in a car crash I was just born this way and there's no interesting tale or you know story behind it but I was wondering for you particularly because of the neurodivergence do you get bizarre questions that people ask you I think it's like a combination of like bizarre questions and bizarre judgments. I think yeah. the one that like a lot of autistic people in particular are so fed up is like, oh, but you don't look autistic or but you don't seem autistic or oh, but you, you must be very high functioning. It's almost like they're trying to reassure you that you're, you know, autism yeah. equals bad and you're OK. So you can't be one of those. It's like, oh, yeah. but you don't seem autistic and I'm like okay thank you all you're telling me now is that I'm masking really heavily so I'm using loads of energy so thank you for (laughs) confirming that with me like yeah I think that's a really strange one of like oh but you don't seem it and it's like okay and that has been absolutely detrimental to my mental health because I've just covered it up for so long um and I think it's this thing of like oh but you're not like my five-year-old nephew and it's like well no obviously I'm not like your five-year-old nephew because I'm a 25-year-old woman um, <laughs> I think that's a really strange one of like yeah people feel this need to like yeah to reassure you that you're not this thing but it's like there's nothing wrong with being that thing you know it's not like I'm going I don't know or I'm a terrible person and they're like oh no you're not a terrible person you're lovely you're fine it's like I'm just telling you something that's neutral about myself. Like you yeah. don't need to reassure me against it. I think yeah. that's a really strange one of like, yeah, not really knowing. Like it just doesn't make sense. Like you wouldn't do it for anything else if someone was like, oh, I don't know. If you wouldn't like reassure someone that they didn't have an illness or whatever, because they clearly they wouldn't have said that yeah. they had it if they didn't have it. So why for a disability are we trying to kind of t- like convince people otherwise um is a very strange one and I think it's like it kind of goes even when people aren't saying it it's like a this strange thing of like now I spend literally my whole life talking about the fact that I am disabled and like everyone who meets me obviously knows because I'm so public about it it's all over my social media it's I often have like even if it's people that I meet in like 
I don't know, the hairdresser, for example, it still comes up because it's my job as well. So like, oh, yeah. what do you do? And I'm like, oh, you know, I'm autistic. I've got ADHD. I write, speak, whatever. It always comes up. But still people don't like accommodate me because they don't know what it means. They're like, yeah. Ellie is autistic, but they don't understand that that means like she needs context she needs clear communication Uh she can struggle with sensory overload she might come across as blunt she needs more quiet time than most people like her battery is smaller than most people's they don't understand that so they're like oh yeah Ellie the autistic person and then they carry on treating me with absolutely no accommodation um which is a really strange one because it's like you know like you well you they, they they know the label but they don't know what that actually means and I think that is like a, just a, the fact that society's understanding of neurodivergence is so so small um yeah. and I think it's a bit of like the whole like pretty privilege thing as well like they see me and they see normal human so they can't yeah. comprehend in their brain that normal human actually has support needs yeah. like it doesn't they just see they see yeah normal air quotes um so they can't like compute almost that like just because I look a certain way doesn't change the fact that I still have support needs yeah and I think that's such such a key one because I quite often feel the same with that so I recently said to someone that what they were asking like oh what do you stand for is like what in life do you stand for and someone was like I stand for peace and I was like that's great and I was like I'm disabled and proud and the guy who was like running this event was like, oh, you mean enabled? And I was like, no, I mean disabled. I said what I said. And he couldn't comprehend that what I had said was that I hadn't just been like, I'm a shithead. I'd actually been like, no, I'm, I'm disabled and proud. And that's OK to say. I was like, no, I'm standing my ground. And he was like, oh, you mean like enabled and empowered? And I was like, no, I said disabled for a reason because I am disabled. And there are things that you need to do for me that will help me in my life. Like sometimes I can't open doors. I can't hold a whole lot of stuff. I need this, that and the next thing. But because I said it in such a way, he was so taken aback and was like, this girl, blonde hair, five foot three, teeny tiny. Like, oh, my God, she's just said this like a terrible, atrocious thing. How can that be correct? And I was like, it is fine. And I said what I said. And I'm going to stick to my ground. <laughs> like. So I can yeah, it's really understand bizarre. that. It is. And yeah. I think what's crazy about society is that when people look, like you said, like pretty privileged, when they look like they quote unquote fit in and they're like, actually, I don't. Like, I look like I should, but actually my brain doesn't work that way. My body doesn't work that way. Something just doesn't quite fit in this area. People are very afraid to be like, oh, how like no 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 you're fine you're fine you're fine the way you are and you're like no no I'm, I'm like it's all good we're neutral about this it's not a bad thing it's not a good thing but I'm just letting you know because there are some things that you need to help me with but if you can't accommodate that that says way more about you than it does about me <laughs> exactly yeah I think it's a real like I think it's something that I've struggled with as well over the the time that I've been working in this space because it's like every every job that I do so maybe I've been hired to speak then I also get this like unpaid role of neurodivergence inclusion manager or advisor or whatever yeah. it is because it's like do you have a quiet space you know what's the lighting going to be like can you send me an agenda ahead of the day yeah. all of this stuff that I need but they don't they don't off the bat understand that I need that thing so I've got to then explain to them all of these things and I think it can be tricky to to just feel like oh I just want to turn up and do what you paid me to do like I don't want to do all of this ask all of these questions and explain myself and explain why I need what I need I just want to do the job Um, so I think that can be a tricky one of people not they don't connect the dots between oh we're hiring someone to come in to speak about neurodivergence so we need to make this experience neurodivergent friendly they don't like it's it is a very weird like disconnect in people's brains of like they they yeah they hear that they seem to hear and understand the label but then they don't have any other kind of understanding of what that actually means yeah exactly I just I think it's hilarious sometimes when I look at the world because I I really often forget that disability is not the norm like it takes a lot for me to realize that actually like my existence the people that I know and some of like my most favorite people our existence and, and the way that we move in this world is not actually normal well like quote unquote normal like we, we're the ones that are meant to be like ostracized 
And so when I go out into the world and like, like you said, like doing talks or speaking to people and they don't necessarily realize that you, you need all these other things and you're like, oh, okay. Like, so this is what society is like, right? Yeah. Like, you guys still don't get it. <laughs> like, yeah. I think as well for me, it's like, I, like, I know obviously that I am disabled. It's my job to talk about that. And it's my life that I live that. But I think you almost because you are in your own little bubble so often you forget how disabled you are like so recently I kind of went out with a new group of friends and they're the friends of the person I'm seeing and and it was like a birthday barbecue and drinks and it was like a, a whole day out and halfway through I was just suddenly like oh I have kind of lost the ability to speak now because I'm so burnt out and everybody else is still just like fine they're going to be out for a few more hours they're having a great time and I am like here in my noise cancelling headphones not being able to get a word out because I'm so drained and all these other normal people are just well normal people quote are still having a great time and they're still having a lovely time and it's really I think you almost forget and there's that moment of like because I wouldn't have ever been in that situation because none of my friends would have been out for six hours because none of us have got the energy to be out for six hours yeah. so we do our two hour lunch and then we go home so you don't kind of get to that point of realizing that oh all of these people have so much more capacity than I do and I just hadn't realized that other humans had that much capacity yeah. um, and I think it's a really like kind of weird yeah it is like oh okay so other people don't have to literally lie in a dark room when they get back from social situations I love that though because I quite often think about so I'm in London quite a lot and I navigate like traveling and all that kind of stuff. But then I forget how much it actually takes it out of my body. So, and I only recently learned this figure, which I think like, I'm genuinely blown away by it. Bear in mind, like I haven't had my hand for my entire life, but I've only just found out that I get 33% more tired than my like, average Joe blogs because I'm missing something ridiculous, like 30 bones. So like this whole idea that everyone's got like 162 bones, it doesn't fit me because I don't have them, don't exist. And because of that, I lack muscle and I lack bones and therefore I get more tired. And I didn't know this until very recently, which means I've gone through like my entire life not knowing this. And I always used to be like, why do I get so tired? Because I can get really, really sleepy. And I'd always be like, I'd be the friend that takes a nap and they'd be like, oh, it's just Brooke, she's just taking a nap. And I'm like, guys, because I'm disabled like (laughs) there is a reason for it that I never knew but like I completely understand that I'm like oh like I wonder what it would be like to not be as tired sometimes (laughs) that would be fun but then equally on the flip side I think I've met some of my most favorite people in the disabled community and I'm like I wouldn't have them and they're the coolest people I know and also quite often the funniest people I know so I'm quite good staying here oh my good (laughs) yeah exactly So I only have one final question for you. And that is, Ellie, are you disabled and proud? I am disabled and proud. (laughs) Yay. (laughs) I have loved this conversation. And I think it's been such an interesting one in terms of your book, masking, unmasking, diagnosis. And actually, I really hope that a lot of people take away goodness from this because I think sometimes particularly in the neurodivergent sphere people feel quite like left alone and like they don't have a hope and I hope that they hear this and think there is some light at the end of uh, like what can be a really difficult tunnel so thank you so much for coming on sharing your story and also giving like your energy to this conversation because I know I need a rest after this so I don't know how you feel (laughs) so thank Thank you so so much much for having me it's been great I loved it it's been so nice to chat I think I think it's sometimes you almost forget, like, I think like you say, the neurodivergent community as well is so within the disabled community, but sometimes it's like, I don't know, not, sometimes it feels like its own. And I think you forget some of the, like the the similarities between all disabled folks experience. And it's like, oh no, it's like, I don't know, I feel like that makes you feel almost less alone with it as well. It's like, oh, it's not just us. Like maybe I don't see other autistic ADHD as that often, but there are so many otherwise disabled folks around me and we're all like have these, these shared experiences and this shared understanding. So I think it's a kind of really, I don't know, it feels like you belong to to more of a more of a group than you thought you did, I think yeah. is a is a nice kind of realization to have. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so excited to read your book. I like, um, yeah, we'll have to have another conversation about this because I've loved it. So thank you so much for coming on. Thank you.